Team Face Funky. <laughs> What's your gun? Dear brother. Oh yeah. Boo! What? What? Hip your smell! What the rock? You got the wrong guy, I'm the dude, man. Welcome to another edition of Around the Turnbuckle. My name's the Big Al Boski. His name right there is Professor Keith. As always, and joining us is the host of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, Stephanie Hardy. Stephanie, how you doing tonight? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing excellent. Now, Steph, pre-show, I did say this to you personally, but I'm going to say it live in front of our audience and that is this girl loves wrestling all right i don't even know her i've never met her i've never talked to her but <laughs> i know this this girl loves wrestling and how do i know this because she does a podcast every day <laughs> like we do it like twice a week Exactly, Keith. We're, we're, we're amateurs at twice a week. She's every day, okay? And she posts on Around the Turnbuckles group page more than we do. Oh, man. <laughs> so, that being said, what made you fall in love with professional wrestling in the first place? Okay. Well, my name is Stephanie Hardy, and I'm the host of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, like they said. And what made me get into wrestling was that I was watching it with my dad. Um, I started watching at the age of four. So this was around the time of the um, Monday Night Wars between WWF and WCW. At Perfect the time. timing. Yeah. So it's just my dad would just have it on, and he would tape both shows all the time because he'd have to work, and then he'd watch them later. So he would tape them on VHS and stuff. And mm -hmm. then he would watch him at my grandma's house at times. And I, he said there was one night where he was watching Goldberg versus Hulk Hogan in the Georgia Dome. There you go. And um, I walked in and I asked him, um, who's who's that guy? And he said, that's Hulk Hogan. And I said, who's the ball guy? And he said, that's Goldberg. And I said, OK. And I just sat with him and just watched wrestling the whole time. And I just never really quit, per se. I say maybe around the time. WCW got bought by Vince McMahon. That was around the time I kind of just fell off a little bit. Cause you know, when right. you're a child, you have so many different interests, you know, cartoons, all that. So I kind of quit. And then around 2002, I got back into it once Eric Bischoff got, you know, um, was the general manager of raw. And after that, I just kept watching it consistently and I've been watching it ever since. So yeah, that's just my story about wrestling. I love it very much. It's brought me a lot of joy. Of course, there's been it's, you know, bad moments where, you know, there's been sad stuff to happen or dark stuff to happen. But right. um, through it all, you know, wrestling has definitely brought me a lot of joy. I've been to a lot of wrestling events with my dad and my sister, but she no longer watches it. But it's OK. She still <laughs> knows enough about it. She's 19. And um, my boyfriend also watches it, too. And his family is into it as well. So it's just kind of like a family dynamic. And I make a lot of my friends, you know, through wrestling, too. So it's just giving me lots of great stuff. And now I have this podcast where I talk about it every week. And <laughs> it's giving me lots of great moments. Well, you have two. It's a good time right now. Well, you have two new friends right here. I am Alan. He is Keith. Um, but I'll tell you one thing. Um, yeah, just by listening to her podcast. And guys, if you haven't listened to her yet, right down on the bottom of the screen there is where you can find her uh, on Apple, on Google, on Spotify, on Our Heart Radio. Um, but, uh, if you haven't listened to her yet, then you, you just hear it. Like you get you get emotional. You get ir you get invested. You get irritated when they do things you don't like, and you and you rejoice when they do things that you do like. In particular, recently, your reaction to Bianca Belair winning the Royal Rumble, man, won me over like like that. It was I was like, you know, I, I really was enthralled by your reaction to her winning the Royal Rumble. Well, I'm glad it makes you feel all those emotions. I didn't know, you know, it really my podcast could, you know, make people feel those emotions like that. But I'm so glad it is. Um, it's just. 
when it comes to Bianca Belair winning the Royal Rumble, it sort of made me feel the same way um, Kofi Kingston winning the WWE Championship did. Right. It was just a huge moment, you know, for me um, in terms of representation as a black woman. Mm -hmm. And when you see stuff like that, you know, it's like you love wrestling anyway, but when you see someone who looks like you, you know, succeeding, you know, in a world that constantly tries to tell you that you don't matter and you see them succeeding anyway, it's just one of the most beautiful things ever, especially when you watch them from the beginning. Um, right. Seeing Bianca Belair, you know, winning all those combine contests in NXT right. when they used to talk about it, you know, on their show um, in on the network. I forgot the name of it. And just watching how she's grown and, you know, people you know, wondering if she was ever going to be good enough to make it to the main stage. And yes, yeah, she did win the NXT Women's Championship, she but did. you have to you have to also think about the fact that even though she didn't win, you, she's kind of almost like Becky Lynch in a sense. She never won the NXT Women's Championship, but look at her now. I mean, of right. course, she's the mother, but when, before she had her baby and stuff, she was the She's star. the man. Yeah, she's the man. So it's just like with Bianca, you saw her work really hard. And then when she got put up on the main roster, you, I was a little bit worried, too. You know, like you mentioned earlier um, about her, you know, coming up to the main roster, knowing, being worried, are they going to do anything with her? You know, and she made her debut at WrestleMania last year. So I'm like, right. OK, so maybe we're here. You know, we're in a good place. And she was kind of off for a second, but then she came back on. But then it's like once she got put on SmackDown, I really believe that was the best move they could have ever made for her. So after that, it's just been smooth sailing. And once she won, I felt so emotional because I felt emotional because also because she got emotional. And it's just like whenever I see it, anybody it, else cry, I it, cry. Right? Right. Like she was so happy. And then when she went to thanking her mom and her dad, you know, for supporting her and her husband, Montez Ford, it was just so beautiful. And then to look at her WWE Chronicle too, where she talked about her struggles with um, eating disorders and depression yes. and yes. all those suicidal thoughts. It's just like, man, can you imagine what would have happened if someone like her wasn't here? on the planet like i can't like i can't imagine that you know and just to see her win is almost like i'm winning so that's just where that emotion came from it's just watching her win was like me winning on the inside so it was great yeah yeah and i i can imagine how you felt about it i personally felt like similar i mean not at, not as crazy about it but i was so happy for her yeah um i i i i have been following her and and um, you know where she came from to where she is now is a it is an amazing story and she's going to get a championship match at WrestleMania which is awesome and and so that I mean that's you know it's an exciting time for her it's a huge time for her and right now with like you said Becky Lynch Elf, she was the face of that division right now um, of course mm -hmm. they pull Charlotte they pull Charlotte whenever they have to pull Charlotte but. Bianca right now is they're pushing her to a point where she could be that she could be that person. Like she could be she could be champion. Yeah, she could. Like the world is her oyster now. And it's just she just deserves all of it because she's worked so hard to get to where she is. And I think it's so beautiful that she didn't even know that this she didn't even know really what she was going to do with her life, which I think is the story of all of us millennials. Right. Which is yeah. running around yeah. trying to figure out what what is going to be that one thing. Or well, something. I'm not a millennial. But <laughs> <laughs> um, those one things. Too I'm a millennial, though. Yeah, you so are technically. Saying. We got a first comment here. Anthony Joseph, he's just here for the trolling. Beware of him. He's, he's oh, a troll. Wow. Okay. Um, if you mention Chris Jericho, I'll but, tell any, you how but anyway, um, we, you and I both agree on it. the one thing you and I both agree on, Stephanie, is is that uh, we 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 have that weird feeling when when our favorite NXT star goes up to the main roster. I mm -hmm. it took me a long way, a long time to get there. Say so Keith's been there forever, all right? Keith's oh, been yeah. there. Yeah, Every he's time been there. Tell me somebody's going up. I'm like career over. Career Aww. over. That, that's where he's at. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's been there for a couple of years now. It took me a long time to get there. But at the same token, some people and now do I am there that when it took somebody like Adam out. Cole. Mm -hmm. Right. I think Adam Cole will yeah. be okay. I just don't know that he'll be Adam Cole. Because, like, for instance, you know, we were talking on the pre-show about it depends on who advocates for you. Right. And who, who it is that's on your side. Like Charlotte's had a charmed experience. And that's not to say she doesn't deserve it and she doesn't work hard. I'm not saying she doesn't. Mm 
mm-hmm. but Scarlett had the Flair bloodline. She had Vince's admiration for anything Flair. So the minute she goes up, she's got the boss in her corner. She's got Vince in her corner. She's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Sasha Banks goes up. Sasha Banks, we all know what Sasha Banks' NXT run was. Just amazing watching her from the beginning and where she came from to where mm-hmm. she is now is yeah. crazy. But she came up as a Triple H girl. And the the knock is when you come up as a Triple H person, Vince doesn't necessarily watch you as much or get it as much. And it almost becomes like you're somebody that came out of WCW or some rival organization. So it takes Vince a heck of a lot longer to get behind you. And you see that in Sasha, you know, wins the title, then loses the title, then wins the title and loses the title. And I think probably the only reason he's really starting to come around on her now finally is, oh, she's on the Mandalorian, which is where I think it might be in Bianca's best interest to try to go after Asuka that's kind of not doing anything. And maybe they can make her the face of the Raw Women's Division. Because I have a hard time seeing with all the Mandalorian hype and everything. And I think Asuka's just, um, not Asuka. Sasha is going to become an even bigger part of that show now with, you know, all the Gina Carano mess that went on. Um, I have a hard time seeing where they're going to want to take the title off of her right now just for political reasons because of the show. Yeah, um, the thing is with the Sasha, see, the Sasha situation is just the fact that even though you did say she is a Triple H girl um, and all of the above, which is something I never really thought about before, but I'm glad you did bring that up. It's just, I remember being very frustrated because I feel like I say all the time on my show that I feel like Sasha Banks is the greatest of all time. I will fight anybody on that. I don't oh, care. she's excellent. Like, she's will tell you, I've always been a big, but, big Sasha Banks proponent. Yeah, but it's just, you know, I feel like with her losing the title as much as she had, you know, when she was on Raw, it was weird because I think in an interview she had with Sam Roberts, she said the reason why they had her lose so much was because they felt like she didn't necessarily need a title to be over. Right. And on the and when you really think about it, she kind of doesn't need a title to be over because she's just she's the boss. Cool, she's the cool factor, you know, all around. Like she's your right. all around star. Um. And I feel like, you know, once she did take that little break she did after WrestleMania um, two years ago, Mm -hmm. and she started to train a whole lot harder and get a whole lot better and have more of an attitude to her, I feel like that was also, you know, helping her as well in terms of her run on Raw, and then they put her on SmackDown, and then she had her whole last year, because face it last year her and bailey were like it for a while right yeah so i feel yep. like that definitely you know plays into it as well and i i for one am here for bianca and sasha fighting because yeah. i just feel like they just both have the they both have similar attitudes but they have different types of swag you right. know so it's just kind of like if you put those two attitudes together where one says she's the boss and she feels like she's the goat and another person says she's the est and she's looking to prove herself one of them are good they're gonna like butt heads at some point they're kind of teasing it on smackdown now but i feel like that would be way better now in terms of oscar i would want rhea ripley to go after oscar for wrestlemania there you go because we haven't seen her since the royal rumble so i'm just right so i would i would be happy about that because that would be something we haven't seen so that would be cool yeah and she was a lot of things too i mean i like that i just worry about because i always come from the principle of if it's your first title run and Bianca's got a lot of momentum behind her, but Sasha's got a lot of momentum behind her, I always worry about how do you get to the end of that? And how do you get to the end of that without hurting somebody? Because you don't want to hurt either one of them in terms of the momentum or the way the way. I don't think you can. I, see, I don't think you can hurt Sasha. I it think seems, if I mean, it seems like you can't. Because, no, I think with the push that you're doing with Bianca, if she loses, that hurts her a lot worse. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put her in there with the momentum she's got right now, with the idea of losing. Unless I'm going to turn her opponent heel, or her opponent is already heel, and I'm going to screw her with the idea of I'm going to come back in a month, two months, whatever. You know, I'm going to do that old school thing of screw the baby face, screw the baby face, screw the baby face, and then finally, you get to that big match where it's like, okay, every trick the heel has done. You know, you can't have your friends run in. Uh, you can't hit hit me with the weapon, or you can't hit me with the title belt. You know, uh, disqualification will make you lose the title, or you know, and we'll put it in the cage or whatever you got to do. And it, 
finally you get to that moment where it's like, I got them. I got them. They can't get away from me this time. They can't screw me over. And they win the title and the place goes banana. Yeah. I think it would be cool, though. I would prefer Sasha turn heel, though, because I feel like once yeah, she Sasha. locked into that heel persona, like she did in NXT, if she went NXT heel Sasha on Bianca, that would be fired and we'd have something. Oh, yeah. Different. Absolutely. Oh, that God. would be great. Um, I would, it, would, it would be too much. So, Anthony... <laughs> So I'm addressing Anthony Joseph, right? He keeps sending me trolling questions to ask you, Stephanie. And um, I don't know if you want to see them or not because they're not meant to be serious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, yeah. Like I said, he said he's just here for the trolling. Like he asked, well, I mean, the one question he did bring up was, uh, how much longer do you think a guy like Goldberg can keep carrying the brand? Which that's <laughs> another one he said is, uh, do you think Doink deserved have at least an IC title run. Oh wow. Um yeah, no, yeah, ignore that. Um so tell us about the tell us about the podcast. Tell us about the podcast. Where where did it come from? Where did it where did it where was it born? Where did the idea how did it all get started? Okay, so once I was actually a part of a wrestling group on Facebook, you know, um, kind of like around the turnbuckle, but not really centered around a podcast show. It was just a place where wrestling fans could just congregate. And yeah. I was an administrator um, for about a year there. And um, it was four other administrators and they had thought about making a podcast. And I was excited about it. Like I was pumped. But somehow or another, it never happened. So... Mm -hmm there was a lot of differences that went into me sort of leaving that group because it was, it was just a lot of drama that I don't want to discuss. Oh, um, no, I, so, I know I, all I've about been, it. Believe me. I, I've been, I've been moderators places, administrators places. So I, I get it. It can be, it can get really toxic really quick. Yeah. And I left and it's just, I really didn't have a place per se to, you know, put all of my wrestling thoughts anymore after that point. So, I had thought about maybe doing a podcast, but just really didn't necessarily have the time to dedicate fully to it right. until there was a point where I had lost my job and I had so much other stuff to do. I had so much free time um, between job interviews and stuff. So I was like, okay, well, let me just try this. And um, I started it after the Royal Rumble um, last year. And I just remember watching it and having so much, so many thoughts and so much to say. And that's kind of where it happened, my first episode. Um, but I was scared because I was just like, I'm starting this podcast and everybody else I've seen start a podcast. It's like they have either this personality or they already have like this fan base or they're famous, you know, and people will actually want to listen to them. I'm just right. some, I'm just some random girl from Birmingham. Who's going to listen to me? <laughs> you know, and I call my first episode Random Girl, Random Podcast, but Same. I was talking about wrestling and it just that was my first episode and my one year anniversary just passed um two weeks ago congratulations, so, yeah, congratulations. thank you so um that's just kind of where it started and then after i started doing it i actually hooked up with other people who found me on instagram and um mostly on facebook and once i found them they started inviting me to stuff and then we kind of just got together in like a message group and they would tell me about you know different wrestlers and i would friend them on facebook and then ask them and then they'd be like of course you know i'll be on your show and blah 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 blah, blah. you know or i'd have fans you know who i was already friends with who would want to be on the show once i said i was starting one so that's just kind of how it started and just started to grow more and more each um week um i i had a chance to do it outside of my job that i had so it was just kind of like that's how it started and i wanted to create a show that was had a chill atmosphere because in the backgrounds you can hear more so r b music in the yeah background yeah and kind of like pop music in the background so that kind of yep. chills you out which is different because sometimes in wrestling you have a whole lot of hard rock stuff and right. i love i love rock music but it's, i love all kinds of music but it's just like you know i just really love r b deep down inside so i was like okay well let me try this here and then also with the positive component sometimes 
you know, I love every person who does wrestling podcasting. Like, I love everyone. But at times, we have a tendency to focus on what we hate about wrestling. Like, we tend to be really hard on the product, no matter what the promotion is. It's like, yeah, yeah we can just... I don't know anyone like that. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> like we can be really that. harsh on it, you know, on what we write about it and all the other stuff. And I kind of wanted to focus on what I love about it because it's something that I enjoy watching like every day. You don't just watch something every day because you hate it. You watch it every day because you love it. So and I have a I have a question from a guy that you might know. Okay. AT Funk. Says hey, with, with so many wrestling podcasts out there, what separates yours from the rest? Well, I'm, I, it's so funny he said that, and I'm answering that question right now. Um, so <laughs> there's the positive component on it and talking about what I love. And then there's the passion component about it because I just love wrestling so much. And I just get really into it the way that a lot of people i can't just say guys because guys like guys and girls watch sports period but mm -hmm. the way that you would hear somebody or see somebody like stephen a smith or max kellerman on first take talk about basketball yes. or football like the way that you would see you know just anybody talking about any form of sports i talk about wrestling that way and you don't yes, expect you do. it, and, and you don't expect it to come from someone like me because I'll never forget the time I had a friend in college who told me that she was so shocked that I watched wrestling because I was so, because I'm very feminine. I have very feminine energy. And that's true because I'm a girl who likes to get my hair done and do all this other stuff with, with you know, clothes and all that. And I love jewelry and all that. But you don't think that somebody who has all those feminine <laughs> qualities will like something as rough and tumble as wrestling. So, you know, once you have that, you know, those two packages put together, um, and also being a black woman too, you're just like, okay, it just pu it just pulls people in. And then I love having conversations with people as well about wrestling too. I could talk about wrestling for hours with anybody. I love that. Yeah. So it's well, just like so can we, so can we, <laughs> so can we. But um, I I do have a uh, Anthony the troll that actually asked a real question back here. He said, "What's the greatest women's title match that could still be put together?" Ooh. I guess he means with the current roster. Ooh. Who the you use? That's a deep question there. Um yeah. thanks. Thank you, Anthony, for that. Um I feel like the greatest women's title match that could still be put together would probably be um I feel like in a sense we were cheated out of a triple threat. Um, with Bianca Belair, Rhea Ripley, and Charlotte. Like, yeah. I feel like, you know, we were sort of cheated out of that because Bianca, of course, we know now that Bianca was being pulled up to the main roster after her match at TakeOver Portland last yes. year. Yeah. Um, so, but a lot of people online were really pushing for that triple threat to happen, but it didn't happen because they were just going with Rhea Ripley versus Charlotte for the NXT Women's title at WrestleMania, which wasn't bad in the least bit. Oh, no, it was a very good match. Yeah, it was really good, but I feel like if that had been a triple threat match between all of those amazingly talented women, mm -hmm. like for that NXT title or whatever title, you know, any of them had, that would have been fantastic. Mm -hmm. Like, I just feel like we haven't had that just yet at all. And maybe one day we will have it, maybe one day we won't, but either way, I feel like that would be a really good one. I think you're I think you're right about your answer to JT Funk's question about how, how different yours is. It's a positive spin. It's somebody who you would, you know, if you're listening to, or if you see what you can, everybody can, right now, you can see like right now, you're not somebody that you would think would be the, as devoted to wrestling as she is. She loves wrestling. And the, the thing is that I think that's what does set you apart. And you did, and you mentioned the ESPN guys, you mentioned, um, Max Kellerman and, and Stephen A. Smith. This show is partly called Around the Turnbuckle based on Around the Horn. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But instead of sports, we talk wrestling. Yeah. And when we don't have a guest, when we don't have a professional wrestler who's on and telling their story, uh, we normally have me and either just me and Keith or me, Keith, and another person or two other people. And we talk about whatever 
you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be current events. It could be breaking news in wrestling. It could be uh, possibly we lost somebody like we talked about at Patterson. Um, uh, Yoko, they, we talked about the Yokozuna documentary they just did about Yokozuna. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Oh, I recommend fantastic. everyone to watch it. He was such a special talent, gone way, way too soon. We talked about the Undertaker's Last Ride documentary. Yeah, which um, obviously was very personal for me. There were tears. There oh, were right. I'm not gonna he's, he's a big, he's a big Undertaker fan. He's what got me into the business, you know. So. And and um, we had a whole ep- we had a whole episode dedicated to women's champions from from the fabulous Mula to Becky Lynch, which which mm-hmm. was fun. Um, but like I, again, that's 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 what we do is like. Uh, when we don't have a guest, but I, I, I don't know about Keith, but I prefer when we have a guest mm-hmm. because it has, it adds a fresh face, adds a fresh ideas, adds fresh, you know, all this stuff. And you're unique because you are just like us. We're really big, huge fans of, re- of professional wrestling. Like your takes on it are from a different, a different corner. Well, thank you. Um, and I, I definitely identify with what you're saying about, you know, trying to be different because it's tough because there's a lot of people in that space and we're out here and we're all who are we. We're just fans. Why are you going to listen to me when you can listen to Rick Blair, when you can listen to Jim Cornette, when you can listen to just about anybody under the sun that can give you a take from the inside? You know, what, mm-hmm. what do we do based on just what we've watched, what we know, or what we get from, you know, the news sites and whatnot, you know, that's very daunting. And I think it takes courage to go out there and be like, no, I have something to say. And my opinion is valid. And yeah, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to say, you know, I'm just as important to listen to, you know, I'm just as valid as somebody who's in the business, you know, to be able to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So I mean, I I think that takes courage to to stand up there, and I think because you're doing a lot more of it by yourself, it's actually more courage than what we do because we always get that ability to go like, yeah, we'll talk for a little bit, and then we have a guest, and we have somebody in the business, you know, to <laughs> to help us out with it. So mm-hmm. yeah, it is a little bit. It was a little bit daunting um, to try to do it by myself because at first. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried to ask anybody I knew who was wrestling fans to do it with me and either they didn't have the time or either they didn't feel comfortable um, talking, you know, on a public platform like that. Mm -hmm. So all I had was myself. So it was just like, okay, well, I have to trust that my voice is going to be enough. And if it's enough, then I'll keep doing this. And if it's not, then I'll just, I might just leave it alone. But I just tried to put my, my whole self and my whole genuine self into it. And it's just been working. And I enjoy talking about it on my own because I talk about different aspects of it. It's like I have news and I have gossip. And then I have, you know, different opinions or takes on different things like trends or, you know, a movie or something that I saw that has to do with wrestling or something or something that made me feel a way or an interview. Yeah. Or an experience that I had on a show with a show or something. And then I talk about and review all the different shows of the week. But I've actually been doing something different this month because it's Black History Month. And mm-hmm. I've actually had um, three guests from the Jobber Tears podcast. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but mm-hmm. they're out in New York. And I had all three of the co-hosts as a guest. Nice. And I've been doing Black History highlights of people because I did do Teddy Long and I also did Aja. I Smith saw the Teddy Long one. So, I saw that Teddy Long one. Yeah. So it's like I've just sort of been, you know, tinkering around creatively with what I can, you know, and can't do, you know, but I've still been watching the shows every week. And I'm pretty sure in March I'm going to start back, you know, doing the regular lineup. But or I might just try and do something for Women's History Month. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, So it's just. It's just creatively, I just love to do it. Do you just, do it random? Do you do it randomly, or do you do it like you don't have a set date? It just kind of, I mean, because you do more than one a week, right? No, I, I well, sometimes I do more than one a week, and other times I just do one a week. One a week. Um, I normally like to do um an episode all weekend, like say today's Saturday. 
Um, I probably would have done an episode and released it earlier this afternoon mm -hmm. um, because I like to do my episodes after I watch all the shows and stuff in this regular format. You get caught up. Yeah, to get caught up with everything and then I talk about it. Um, okay. And then there are other times where there was one time where I did a regular episode and then did a surprise episode to talk about an NXT takeover. Or I'll have times where my interview will go like super long, like maybe a whole hour, and then that'll be the whole episode, and then I'll make another episode to talk about the regular stuff. So sometimes it varies depending on what happens. Because the amount of times that I see you post on around the Turnbuckles group page, it seems Every like day. you're doing it. Those are all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's almost every day because I'm just now that I have, you know, more um, access to apps and stuff that helps me, you know, release different audio um, clips and stuff like that. Like I just use it as a form of relentless promotion, like kind of like I kind of have the idea behind it, like that commercial that you see all the time with that one brand that gets on your nerves that you're just sick of. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of what I have you know, the mindset that I have with the podcast, it's like, you're going to know who I am and you're going to listen to this because I know y'all like wrestling. So here this is, you know, it's just kind of relentless. And I know it probably gets on a lot of people's nerves, but that's, that's you know, my nerves, you know, that's just how I feel like you have to be when you believe in something so much. So it's just, it, you have to put everything into it. If it's it got like, on, if it got on, on my nerves, if it got on my nerves or if it got on Keith's nerves, I, I there's no way I would have had you on here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just kind of relentless about it, but I just, that's just my hustle behind it. I just want to, I believe in it so much now that it's just like, yeah, this is Well, my you're driven though. I mean, that's great though. You're driven to, 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 to do it. I mean, do you have plans to, or have you already monetized the podcast? Um, I'm still figuring that part out, you know, like I'm still learning, you know, every day. Now, in terms of a sponsor, since I record um, using the Anchor app, like I have that as a um, a sponsorship right now. Anchor.fm, yeah. Yeah, and I have that. But um, aside from any other like monetary thing, like I haven't really figured that component out just yet. I don't know. Right. So I figure the more I learn about it, maybe the more I'll try and monetize it for something. I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> like I still feel like a baby in this. It's a lot. I mean, we're we're trying to figure that out too. I mean, what we do here, what we do here on Around the Turnbuckle is live streaming, right? Not to be confused with podcast. Mm -hmm. Podcast. A lot of a lot of live streamers, quote unquote, call that a podcast. And in reality, what we're doing is we're live streaming video. Mm -hmm. uh, where, like, I just started a new podcast called like the Big Alboski Raw, which is just my thoughts and feelings on the world in general, not necessarily wrestling or sports or whatever. But um, I uh, I also dabbled into like Anchor.fm just to, just giving it a tryout, and I saw where you can get spot. It's exciting, right? Because you can get you can get sponsors, or you can get you get paid for mentioning like Anchor.fm every single time you have your podcast. Um, it's a real easy way to start one. Anchor.fm. Mm -hmm. But um, but. You know, I think that this out hasn't. The, don't you think that there's been an outbreak of podcasts during COVID nineteen? Are you asking me? Yeah, no, I'm asking you. Don't you? Don't you think? Yeah, I do think so because it's just like in the midst of everybody being in quarantine and not really having a lot to do. That is, if you know they don't have the kind of job that's essential. And shout out to essential workers because y'all are the real MVPs. Oh, yeah. Um, Thank you for that. I, I am an essential worker myself, so I, I do appreciate that. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's just a lot of people have just, you know, sought ways to just sort of put themselves out there. And I think podcasts have grown, you know, and I didn't realize how much it was a thing until I was listening to the radio one day going to work and they were talking about, we have reached a golden age of podcasts. And I was just like, really? <laughs> and, it, and it kind of has and it kind of has yeah. because you know everyone's just sort of stuck inside and bored so like, you know what I think I'm going to start a podcast and start a side hustle about this thing and, mm -hmm. it's, and it works you know the cool part is is right now during COVID-19 a lot of our wrestling friends are having trouble getting booked in live shows mm -hmm. so we give them an outlet where they can come here and they can tell their story and they can 
in their minds or in their hearts in the, you know, like they, 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 they just love coming on, not only telling their stories, but also just, just talking wrestling just to get that fire lit again. And I love yeah. that we do that. I love that we've become that and keep us too. I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's great to see, you know, cause wrestling is just, it's so hard to describe what it is to somebody that doesn't get it. And I have friends that they do not get it. They do not watch it. They do not care. They walk in a room and if they see, especially what goes on now and they're just like, this is stupid. Why do you watch this? <laughs> and then I will go to them and I will be like, uh, I have one friend. She doesn't pay attention to anything now. But I was telling her yesterday about the story of um, how Terry Funk was almost one of the knights in uh, the Survivor Series match between Brett and Shawn Michaels. And he bailed out and he bailed out in like the funniest way ever where he had gotten to the building and they told him, you know, when the knights get beat, we're going to unmask them. And he's like, you're going to let me get beat by Bret Hart's brothers that haven't wrestled in forever. You're going to unmask me. I still make a lot of money in Japan and elsewhere. I'm a former world champion, this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go with no. But instead of saying no and saying bye-bye, he leaves them a note. And he just, like, disappears. And the note is... My horse is very sick. I have to go back to the ranch right now. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> that's the best way to leave a situation. <laughs> that is. That is. It was what? Three or four years before they brought him back in for the Chainsaw Charlie thing. And I think that was yeah. only because Mick was so insistent. Like, Please bring Terry in because we're going to do a WrestleMania program where he wanted to do like an explosion match and stuff like that, like they did in Japan for WrestleMania. And I still to this day do not understand why he thought they were going to let him do anything close to that <laughs> at WrestleMania because not just from the perspective of that's not what WWE does, even mm -hmm. in the height of the Attitude Era, that wasn't. A thing they would do. Um, there's also a lot of different state laws and things from the athletic commissions where they'll be like, you want to do what? No. What planet do you live on? No. Like, I'm actually very surprised that AEW got an athletic commission or anything somewhere to say, yeah, you can do uh, barb, no rope barbed wire with explosions. Oh, wait, it's Florida. <laughs> of course they did. It's Florida. All right. Now, speaking of that, like you mostly the most of your podcasts that I've seen, you talk more about WWE than any other place. How much attention do you uh, give to other um, wrestling organizations uh, besides WWE? Um, I try to watch AEW every now and again. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like. Um, this is gonna sound really sad, but it's just the first the first episode I paid that much attention to with AEW was of course the Brody Lee tribute. Um, but oh. that was the most but that was the most sweetest episode I had ever seen of a like the sweetest tribute episodes I've ever seen. I've seen a lot of them, but that one was just well done all around. It was just sure. really hard, heartfelt and I've been trying to keep up with them ever since. Also because um I've also been trying to keep up with their women's division a whole lot more since I have Thun I had Thunder Rosa on the show last year. Oh wow. Yeah, like I had an interview with her and I've been keeping up with um AEW just a whole lot better than I did, you know, within the first year because it was just kind of like off and on with me. Well, actually, when they first started, I didn't have the podcast. So I didn't really have a need <laughs> to sort of, you know, pay attention to everything. Um, but I try to look at Impact every now and again, too, because Tuesdays yeah. are kind of like my down days where I don't really um, do that much at night. But then here's the problem. Young Rock now comes on. Oh, boy. Opposite. You know, even though it's just 30 minutes, but Young Rock now comes on, you know, at seven o'clock with Impact, too. And I actually like some of the talent that Impact has to offer, you know, since I have been watching it. Um, one of my favorites on there is Chris Bay. Um, 
I watched their tag team tournament that they had for the women, the knockouts um, tag team titles. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I've been paying attention to that a whole lot more, you know, here lately. So I try my best to peep in on everyone else, you know, at times. But sometimes I get, sometimes I feel like if I watch too much wrestling, my head will explode. Yeah. And, yeah. and I just, and sometimes I just need a little bit of a break. <laughs> so <laughs> sometimes it's not that I don't want to watch these other promotions, just that I need a break at times because when you watch wrestling it's like between a pay-per-view and then you have a raw and then you have impact and then nxt and then you have thursday which is yeah. nothing and then you got friday which is smackdown and then you might have another pay-per-view on a saturday um because i feel like impact likes to have their stuff on saturdays you're just it's like a whole week of wrestling yeah. it's just every like, day there's no, there's no break in between so it's just like i have other stuff that i'm interested in too so it's just like i need to breathe <laughs> you mentioned young rock how yeah. do you feel? How do you feel about it? I love it, and it's just the cutest. I feel like it's one of the sweetest ways for him to talk about his life, and it's so funny because um, it's like he talks so much about his life on Instagram and in interviews and stuff. If you're a wrestling yeah. fan, you know everything, but it's just kind of like when you have someone who isn't a wrestling fan. I think it's a great tool for them to learn, you know, more about wrestling and ask questions about it, and then it's like they can see. You know, that he wasn't just some blah, blah, movie star. You know, he was he started off here and then now he's he, he was in wrestling and now he's a big star. But it's only because wrestling helped to catapult him there. Mm -hmm. And I think and I think that show, you know, does a really good job of humanizing his life and humanizing the people, you know, who he was surrounded by in his childhood and also humanizing his childhood and letting us know that he didn't have a silver spoon in his mouth because his dad was a wrestler like. Mm -hmm. He didn't like his family had it a little bit hard, but he still earned everything he ever got. And I think that's one of the coolest parts about Young Rock. You're seeing him, you know, be human, even though we sound, we sort of know him as this superhuman man who does everything and never sits down at all because he has a new movie out every couple months. Right. So it's just, you know, I love this show. And then I think the best part about it was one of my friends from college texted me the other day about the show and was like, hey, did you watch Young Rock? And she doesn't watch wrestling at all. But she knows <laughs> I love wrestling. So she was like, I watched it and I actually liked it and it was cute and da 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 da. And we can have conversations like that. And I think that's one of the best, most underrated parts about wrestling. It's like when you can pull someone in who's never watched it before and oh, yeah. you make them fascinated with it too. So I try I like to do that all the time. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Times a dozen. Yeah, with the Young Rock, where did they find these actors? That, I mean, they have great actors for the Samoans, the Wild Samoans. They have mm -hmm. great actors. They have, where did they, where did they get Andre the Giant? I don't know. Like, like, where <laughs> where did that guy come from? They look so perfect, right? They're like spot yeah. on. It's insane. I mean, he, I mean he's a great actor, uh, big guy, uh, French accent. I mean, he looks like. He looks like Andre from 1975. Right. And then mm -hmm. and then also the guy who's playing Teenage Rock, his name is Bradley Constant. He's from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Oh, there you like, go. Like that's that's yeah. about 45 minutes to an hour away from me. So I thought that was really cool. So I was like, okay, homeboy, I see you. <laughs> you ever been to Al you ever been to Alabama, Keith? I have not. I've been I like I said, I, I told her earlier, I've been through there, but not, not I didn't stay there. You know, I I was on my way. I was driving through, so. Yeah. yeah my, my concern with the show, too, was how they would treat the business because, I mean, there is, there's really, with those particular characters that he grew up around, you know, there's a lot of things you can say good or bad about them, you know. Uh, especially Iron Sheik. Uncle Iron Sheik immediately springs to mind because we all mm -hmm. know the Iron Sheik stories and some of the problems Iron Sheik has had. Like, the older he gets. Iron Sheik was one of the guys that kind of accidentally exposed the business because he got caught riding with Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Yeah. And they were doing things they shouldn't. So that was a complication or there was the time that they drug tested Sheik and they came back to him and they said, Sheik, uh, your drug test came back. Okay, Sheik's drug test came back. What, what did Sheik's test say? Uh, well, you are positive. There you go. Sheik always positive. Yes, Sheik is very <laughs> positive. Uh, no, no, Co Cosmo. I remember Cosmo's that. Cosmo's dad. You don't want positive. Positive means you are doing uh, things you shouldn't be doing. Oh. Right. 
Yeah, but I felt like it was adorable, you know, how you had like little pet names for them in the show. Yeah. Yeah, and then I, I also I also really love the fact that as a 10-year-old him, he was actually able to talk to his own to talk to Alpha and Sika and tell them, you guys were horrible. You made me believe it. I love it. And I was just like, he understood. <laughs> like, yeah. and they're actually talking about you right. know, the gimmick and putting it over. And I'm just he like, understood yeah. the business before, <laughs> you know what I mean? He understood the business when he was a kid. Yeah. Which, which is not typical of every kid, especially back then. You know, a lot of guys would not smarten their kids up because they were afraid. You know, I smarten the kid up, the kid's going to go to school and he's going to tell people, and then we're all out of a job and we're screwed, you know? So I mean that was that was interesting to me that I and maybe it was by necessity that Rocky Johnson had smartened him up and smartened him up so young. Mm -hmm. I think I thought that was great. And yeah, it, I'm just really excited for what's to come from it. And, so and it's also it also shows you like a wrestling family when they're away from the business at home. They're just like any other family. They're, they're, you right. Know, yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's 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 good, and I, I look forward to the rest of it. Um, I don't know about you, Stephanie, but I wish I, I live in a fantasy world where I wish that kayfabe was still a thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because um, I, yeah, because well, you know, I I I've, 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 I I'm not much of a reader. Keith's more of the reader. You can see all the books behind him. Uh, you know, he he's he reads for me, and then he and then he lets me know how it goes. <laughs> but um, uh, but um, there were there's there, there's a lot of books out uh, that from from legends and people in the business of of a time when it was when it was more when it was more real or it felt more real. Do you do you agree that it's getting away from that now that there's now that every now with the with social media and with you know people seeing people you can't you can't hide the fact that so and so and so and so are together or you can't hide the fact that so and so are friends or not you know you know can't go anywhere right I mean I don't know about you but I I I almost wish we can go to a place where like the heels are in one locker room and the faces are in another locker room. You know, um, you know, I could kind of see how, you know, and that feeling is valid, you know, because it was sort of easy when we were younger to see, you know, this person is a bad guy and this person is a good guy um, because we just had no clue, you know, what they were doing because there wasn't that much accessibility to their lives. And, but I don't necessarily have an issue with kayfabe, I guess you could say, being dead in, instead yeah. of in some cases. Because, I mean, Bray Wyatt, to a certain degree, I, it's like he sort of teeters and totters between not kayfabe and kayfabe at the same right. time. Mm -hmm. But it's just, I feel like with kayfabe not really being so much as a thing, we're able to sort of see them as, I feel like it could it could be... For the better and also for the worse, because we're able to see them as fully realized human beings. Right. Um, and you can see them as superhuman because what they do isn't necessarily the most normal thing. You know, they're they're athletes and everybody can't do half the stuff that they do. I respect them so, so much. Yeah. So it's like you respect them, you know, for everything that they're able to pull off, you know, from a superhero, from a superhuman um um, standpoint, but you also realize that they're human beings who are just like you, who go through struggles just like you. And I think that makes them more accessible to sort of look up to them as humans and look up to them as heroes in a sense that they're doing this, but they're still struggling, you know, with regular things that we are as well. Um, but I feel like there's a bad component to it because I feel like there are some wrestling fans who take the whole television thing and then they warp it to where they feel like they have that coupled with social media and they feel like they have access to them to the point to where they can either tell them what to do, boss them around or stalk them. And yeah. that's just absolutely rude. Like you can't just, you know, run up on these people and just say whatever and do whatever to them just because you feel like, Oh, well, I felt a connection through TV. Like I know there's a way you can do it and be a fan without coming off as a complete creep. And I feel like it can have, it's like, 
our accessibility can have lots of good things because there are the moments where you comment on something they do and then they'll comment right back. Like that's the kind of cool stuff that you like. But then yes. there are some other people who will just take stuff like that and then take it too far. Yeah. Um so it's kind of like a good and a bad situation. I hope that answers your question. I feel like oh, it I, does. Do you, do, you miss, <laughs> do you miss live fans in the audience as much as I do? No offense, no offense to the Thunderdome. I do. Like, I do miss the fans because it felt like the fans were kind of like the third Part character. Of the show. character. Mm -hmm. Like, we're like the third character because it's like, if we love yeah. something, we'll say so. And if we don't, we'll say so too. And sometimes we change our minds at times. And that is kind of something I miss a little bit. And I love going to live shows, you know, and meeting some wrestlers. Like that's the part I really miss and making new friends and stuff. But in terms could you of drop some could you drop some names of wrestlers you've met? Oh, yes. Um, I've met um Heavy Machinery. I met Otis and Tucker. Nice together. And they were really sweet. Um, they autographed. Actually, I have lots of autographs. I've met Charlotte Flair. Oh, um, now he's jealous. Oh, That's <laughs> I met Charlotte Flair at a meet and greet at a Cricket Wireless before a SmackDown show, um, and she was really nice. And I've met Ric Flair at a um. Oh wow! I met Ric Flair Ooh. at a Comic Con. Yeah, that was awesome. He was so nice, and that just meant the world to me. I couldn't believe it. And um, I've met Bailey. I've met Bailey, and. I've met Simon Gotch when he was with the VOD villains. I met him. Oh. Yeah, and I met There's him. one that there's one Keith really liked. Oh yeah, those I guys, love those them. Those guys were very underrated. They, they were really so were. good. They really so were good. So good. Um, and I met Rich Swan too when he was in WWE with 205 Live mm. and TJ Perkins as well. And I've met Byron Saxon twice. He's my favorite. Like I love him <laughs> so much. So yeah, those are a couple of people that I've met that I can remember right now off the top of my head. So yeah, I, I, those, that's a huge list. Uh, I'm sure you have more that you that you're not thinking of at the moment, but I have exactly four. Mm hmm. And who uh, four? I well, because I, I I went to I, I've been to three WrestleManias and they had the access and things like that, and uh -huh. so I stood in line for autographs for um. For three different wrestlers at three different at all three WrestleManias, mm -hmm. but that I that I've attended. But uh, a friend of mine got me a gift to meet Dolph Ziggler because he is my he is my favorite. Oh, um, and I met him at Comic Con in Philadelphia uh, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. I met him, and I have a picture of him and I standing together, and and uh, I actually. He was so awesome. Like he, 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 he didn't have to because they were kind of rushing. Like the people were kind of rushing people along, but he was taking a minute to talk to each person, which I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And you know, he, so we, we got our picture taken and then he autographed it for me or whatever. But like, I talked to him for like a quick minute, but it was, it was really awesome. Um, I stood in, in line for two hours. I, I think it was, I think it was more almost closer to two and a half hours to get the autograph of the undertaker at wrestlemania 17. wow um and everybody was asking him the same he was wearing the biker get up and he was wrestling triple h that year in houston texas and um everybody in line when you're in line like i got like farouk and bradshaw were next to him and you had to walk past if like it, it was kind of embarrassing because whichever per, per, whichever uh, portrait you purchased to get to get signed is who you were going to. But you had to actually walk past Farouk. So either you bought their portrait, too, and you got signed by both of them or you only got the undertakers. Mm -hmm. And I had to literally walk past. Farouk and Bradshaw and have Bradshaw flash me a look like, really? You're not oh. getting our, like you're not getting our autograph too? And then I get to The Undertaker. Now, I'm watching the people talk to him and they're all asking, like, they're all saying the same stuff. Oh, I love you. You're the best. Blah, blah, blah. Yada, yada. So I'm trying to think of something that he would remember me by. Not that he would now, but I'm saying 
that he would remember at least for that day, right? And my idea that was in my head as I'm sitting there for two hours in line was I'm going to ask him to stand up. I'm going to say, yeah, I am. When I get when I get up there, I'm only going to have this chance once. I'm going to say, can you do me a favor? Can you stand up? The worst he could say to me is no. Right. All right. But he didn't say no. He said, why? <laughs> and I said, I just want to see if you're as big as you really seem to be on TV. Mm -hmm. Like, I was all cocky about it, too. Wow. I was completely mar marking out. I was like, oh my God. So he so he slams his hands down on the table. He stands up and I go, okay. So you got visible heat with Bradshaw and you got probable heat with The Undertaker. Correct. That's and he didn't want to be alive. He, he, sat, <laughs> and he sat back down and he didn't ask me my, like he was asking everybody their names and he was saying like to whoever the under, like RIP The Undertaker. He didn't ask me my name because I made because I made him stand up. He just put he just put the Undertaker and he handed it to me. He says, Have a nice day. Wow. But anyway, no. But Ziggler, like I said, Ziggler was cool. And then so what I say, I said Ziggler, I said Undertaker. Um Randy Orton was at another Comic Con that I was at um uh in Philadelphia a couple years before that, but he wasn't all that like he was like he, they were kind of rushing us through, and I didn't even really get to talk to him. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one is interesting. The fourth one is Kofi Kingston. Right? <gasps> didn't you have like a, like a quick? Kofi and what happened there was Kofi. Uh, they were doing a they were doing an event, a live event here in Pennsylvania at Stable Arena at Lehigh University. Such and to watch wrestling in so good. You can sit in the oh. last row of the bleachers. Perfect. And you're still in a good seat, yes. It only it's a place, it's like a real intimate setting. It only holds about like five thousand people. Mm -hmm. All right, but anyway, you could see the wrestlers if you stood in the back of the arena. You could see the wrestlers as they pulled up in their rental cars and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And Kofi, everybody gets out and they're taking their bags and they're going. Everybody's yelling at everybody, but they're all waving or whatever. And you know, Ziggler goes by, and Sheldon Benjamin goes by, and this one goes by, and that one goes by. Kofi pulls up and he gets out. He's by himself. All right. It wasn't, it was before the new day and all that stuff. He was, he was by himself and he gets out, he gets his bag out. He's the only one that came up and started signing autographs and posing with pictures with everybody. Oh, so I got him to take a picture with my son and Zachary, Zachary, not Alan, Keith. And, yeah, I, and, I and, and, um, yeah. It was the thrill of my son's life because he was like, oh, my God, I'm like Kofi Kingston put his arm around them and I took their picture and, and I was and on my phone or whatever. And I was like, oh, thanks, Kofi. He's like, oh, no problem, man. And they high five me and did one of those. And it was cool. Oh, my God. You're so lucky. I love Kofi so much. I had an interaction with Kofi at a live after a live show, except he was walking away because I guess he was tired. Um, so this guy ever. Yeah, he's so sweet. And I yelled at him and I said, I love you, Kofi. And he, you know, pointed at me and then waved and then put his hand on his heart. And I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> <laughs> that just made my entire life because that was that was after, you know, he had lost the championship and everything. But it's just that what that what him winning the championship, you know, meant to me was just everything. So, oh, yeah, to have him do. He, he so that, deserved it. So deserved oh it. I want to meet him one day. Like I'll meet him and just talk forever. You will. I think you will. <laughs> oh my god, I have to. I have um, to. So tell people one more time where they can find you. Okay. Well, like I said before, my name is Stephanie Hardy, and I'm the host and creator of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. You can listen to me on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, um, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And you can follow me on Instagram at Hardy Wrestling Podcast and follow me on Twitter at Hardy Wrestle Pod. And no, I'm not related to the Hardy Boys. That's my <laughs> actual last name. <laughs> That's that was going to be Keith's next question. Not, I'm not related to the Hardy Boys in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. We just have the same last name. <laughs> One last thing. Is there any question you want to ask us either collectively or separately? Uh, well, I guess this one could be separately. Um, what... 
Who are you guys' top five wrestlers, male or female? Mm. You're going. You're going Mount Rushmore. Uh, I guess you could say yeah, that too. You know, if you are you going WWE? Are you going WWE, or does it matter where they wrestle? It doesn't matter at all. Like it could be anywhere. Doesn't matter. Mm. Bruno San Martino. Mm -hmm. Ric Flair. I, I, uh, Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Mm -hmm. And The Undertaker. That's pretty good. And I would say tops out of what I've seen. Um, I got to put Taker on that list. I'm going to say Shawn Michaels. Oh, yeah. I'm not putting that up. Yeah. I'm going to say uh, Terry Funk. Um, starts to get a little harder after that. I'm trying to think what I would base on the one who I've seen. Um, I think Scott Hall was tremendous and is still somewhat underrated, even though everybody knows who he is. Mm -hmm. Um. If I was going for... You only got to do five, Keith. Yeah, I'm up to what? Three right Three right now? Four right now? You just said four. Yeah, of course. We just got How one. is The Undertaker not on that list? I think he's going to take her last, I think. Oh, he, okay. Like, he mentioned him, you know, like, already, I think. Yeah. Um, As far as women... As far as women go... That's what I, I was say, trying to think of. Yeah, as far as women go, I would say Moolah. Back. Mm -hmm. I think wait, for just her place, her place in the business, Fabulous Mula, uh, for the longest time, right? Yeah. And then maybe uh, Trish, Trish, Lita, Charlotte, Becky Lynch. Yep, that's pretty uh, solid. Yeah, I, I definitely go for Trish and Becky because, I mean, Trish, you got to respect the work ethic. She could have come in there and just been like, I'm hot. I don't have to learn anything. I don't have to do anything. No, she actually yeah, wanted she to didn't do that at all. She, no, she absolutely went out of her way to be like, nope, want to learn how to do this, want to learn how to do it well, don't care how much it hurts, right. want to do this correctly. He, my son answered this question. My son answered this question directed towards you. Of course, and it's all AEW guys just to annoy me. Oh, it's Goldberg, Lesnar, Jericho, the Blue Meanie, and Bastion Booger. Oh, wow. He's not serious. He's just <laughs> doing that right away. Like, Kenny Omega, Matt Jackson, Nick is. Jackson, Cody. Oh, wow. Rhodes and Hangman Page. Okay. Hi, so, <laughs> so yeah, that's my son. That's my son, Rhodes Stephanie. All right. So, Stephanie, who's your Mount Rush? Who's your Mount Rushmore? Well, okay. If I had a Mount Rushmore for the women, um, I would say um, May Young. Um, yeah. I would also say, um, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, I would say yeah. Mae Young, definitely um, Trish. I would say Lita and Sasha Banks and Charlotte. Those are there my, you, you know, those are my five. Um, um, yeah. And then for the men, yeah. I would say it's definitely Ric Flair, um, Shawn Michaels, The Rock, um, Eddie Guerrero. Mm -hmm. and um, Ray Mysterio. I like it. Yeah, yeah I mean, Eddie Guerrero is so influential. Uh, almost everybody for a while that was coming on the show, we would ask them about like influences, people that caught him in business, Eddie Guerrero. The people that they want to pattern themselves after it was immediately Eddie Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero. Yeah, I feel like there would have been so it would have been so beautiful had he lived. Like, because yeah. I feel like in my mind, I feel like I could see him either coaching NXT or fighting or maybe fighting Santos Escobar. Yeah. <laughs> like, that would be my dream. Yeah. Like, or him Absolutely. versus Andrade or something. That would be amazing. All right. She has been Stephanie Hardy from the from the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. He is the big, he is the professor. I'm the big Alboski. You can follow her on the bottom there, Twitter at at Hardy Wrestle Pod, uh, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio. Stephanie, do not go away when we go off. 
Tomorrow night, boys and girls, the professor and I have around the turnbuckle at six o'clock, and we will have Damian Wayne. No relation to Bruce Wayne, Keith. Don't go all Batman on me right now. <laughs> I know how you get. Damian Ooh, Wayne. Fun. Damian Wayne will be fun. Will be tomorrow night, six o'clock, right here. Tomorrow night. Night, Damian Wayne. We cannot wait to talk to your veteran in this business, and he has lots to say. Trust me, the unpredictable one will be here tomorrow night. Don't forget to tune in to the rest of our program, Spitting with Spitter, on Wednesdays. Uh, also, around the turnbuckle is Saturdays and Sundays, of course, at six o'clock. Home Team Sports is Tuesdays, and check out my new podcast that I'm starting. Just started yesterday, actually. Yeah, I just started yesterday called. Big Al Boski, Raw. And Keith and my son got a little bit something cooking maybe coming to 2M1L Media pretty soon. Go to our YouTube channel at 2M1L Media and subscribe and share and all that good stuff. Check out Steph. Find Stephanie. She's amazing. You were amazing on tonight. Very much for coming hey. on. Keith, you have any parting gifts for Stephanie? Uh, yeah, just that was a fun hour. Thank you for coming on and thank you for hanging Wait. out with us. Thank you for having me. This was great. Yeah, and don't go away. We'll we'll be right back with you in a second. Okay. We'll all see you next time on Around the Turnbuckle. Ladies and gentlemen. Watch it. Get it. Damn, brother. Oh, yeah. Woo. What? What? If you smell, what the rock?